I know sometimes it may not always feel that way. Well, last week as we entered into the Christmas Advent uh, season of the year, we began this Christmas series that we're continuing this week, He Will Be Called. And as I told you last week, the, the foundation of this entire four-week series is based upon an Old Testament Advent prophecy about Jesus' birth that was given some 700 years before Jesus would actually arrive on this earth for the purpose of being our Savior. We, we find this Advent Christmas promise in Isaiah chapter 9. This is the foundation of all that we're looking at over these next four weeks. In Isaiah 9 verse 6 it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He will be called Wonderful Counselor. That's what we talked about last week. And if you missed that message, you can watch it on our website or on our YouTube channel. He will be called Mighty God. That's what we're talking about today. And he will be called Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace, and that's, that's, what, that's what's coming over the next couple of weeks. Now, there are many different ways that we can experience and witness just how mighty our God is. But perhaps there is none other that is greater than the natural world that is all around us. For example, in Australia, you will find one of the seven natural wonders of the world. It's the Great Barrier Reef. This is a picture of the Great Barrier Reef. Now, I've not actually been there before. Someday I hope to go. I'm curious, has anybody actually been to Australia and seen the Great Barrier Reef? Any world travelers here? No? All right. Our world is kind of small. Oh, is there somebody? All right. Excellent. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, I've not been to the Great Barrier Reef, but I understand that it is about 1,600 miles long, that it encompasses about 133,000 square feet, and that it is the only natural wonder of the world that can be seen from space, that it's that marvelous. And those who have been there say that the white sandy beaches and the crystal clear water is just absolutely amazing. And while the greatness and the majesty of God can be seen in many places, I think you would agree that there are some places that just make it so much more obvious that God's fingerprints are just all over it. Like me, most of us have not been to the Great Barrier Reef. But without a doubt, you've seen some things that make you say, wow. God, it looks like you might have just outdone yourself. Maybe it's sipping coffee on the beach while you're listening to the waves come rolling in. That's one of the things that I, I really love, actually. God has a sense of humor. He sent me to Kansas. <laughs> hey, the ocean's only about, what, 10 hours away? I don't know, something. It's not close. That's okay. But it's a blessing. Or, or maybe it's for you just watching some amazing, majestic sunset. Or maybe it's out on a on a dark night away from the city lights and you're just gazing at the stars in that clear cloudless sky whatever it is it's these moments that that make you appreciate our creator the creator of the universe it's in those moments when we get a glimpse into just how mighty our god really is and what i want us to understand today is that that's really what Christmas is about. 
Christmas is about celebrating the advent, the arrival, the coming of Jesus, our mighty God. And not only that he came into this world, but that one day he's returning and he's coming back. In the Old Testament, we find an Old Testament scripture in the prophet, prophetic book of Jeremiah. And we find this beautifully just crafted scripture that speaks of how great and how mighty God is. We find it in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17. It says, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Ah, oh, God, by your great power, nothing is too hard for you. You know, that word that we find here in Jeremiah 32, 17, it begins our verse, ah. That's an interesting word right there. Because that word in the Hebrew language, the original language of the Old Testament, it's a word that means something much different than the way that we typically use that word. See, we typically say ah as a way of like indicating surprise. Like, like when we discover something, when, when something dawns on us, when we have this new revelation, right? We're like, ah, there it is. I get it now. Or sometimes we use that word ah as like a word filler, right? As a, as a way of kind of filling in our thoughts, like you're, we're, you know, we're processing and we're trying to come up with what to say and we're like ah, and then we say something ah, you know. That's not the meaning though in Hebrew. In Hebrew, the word is more of a groan. It, it's more of a, even at times, a painful groan it's kind of like ah it's like it's painful and and I know you know what I'm talking about I know you've probably said it before you you've probably said it maybe at the gas pumps right you're filling up your car and you see how much it's going to take to fill it up from e to f and you're like ah or you're at the grocery store right and you're checking out and you see, <laughs> you see the painful effects of inflation, right? And how much it's costing for so little. And you're like, ah, this, this inflation stuff is painful. Well, it's, it's almost as if Jeremiah is saying, ah, ah, God, my, my head hurts at trying to understand how great and how mighty God is. My head just hurts. I can't wrap my head around his might, his power. I just can't do it. Now, there are three characteristics that are sometimes used to help us sort of understand how great and how mighty God is. But ultimately, these three characteristics, they really just make our head hurt more. Because we can't fully understand how mighty God is. But, but those three characteristics, they come from the, the Latin root word omni. Maybe you've heard this before. Omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. Omniscient simply means that God knows everything. He knows everything, even our thoughts. Wow, anybody's head hurting? That he knows even our thoughts. Omnipresent means that God is everywhere. And we say that and we think, oh, okay, yeah, that's great. God's everywhere. But think about that. That means he's in every place. And he's in every church. And he's with every believer simultaneously. Your head hurting? Like, how is that? He's that mighty. And, and then he's omnipotent. That, that simply means that God can do anything. Or as the prophet Jeremiah says, nothing is too hard for him. And yet, even knowing and believing these things about 
the advent of the mighty God that we celebrate at Christmas, if we're just being totally and completely honest, we would have to admit that there are some times when we don't feel his power. There, there are some times when life is just so hard, so challenging, so difficult, so crummy, that we don't feel his power. And we can even sometimes be like, okay, God, where is your power in my life? As we look at the world around us, it's a mess, isn't it? We look at what's happening in Israel. We see what's happening in Ukraine. We, we see all the pain and all the suffering and all the wars and all the famines. And we sometimes just think, God, where is your power, right? And so I, I don't know where you're at today, but maybe... Maybe during this supposed most wonderful time of the year, maybe that's where you're at and you're just struggling and you're just hurting and you're just trying to make sense of it all. And you're just like, where's God? Where's his power in my life? Because you've got problems, right? I mean, we all do. Some problems are bigger than others, but we've all got some problems, Maybe for some of us, you know, maybe you're struggling with a relationship or maybe it's with finances or, or maybe it's with a health issue or maybe it's that you have a dream of something that you want to happen and it just hasn't happened and you've prayed about it. Lord knows you've prayed about it. You've prayed and you've prayed and you've prayed and, and seemingly nothing is happening. And, and so we come into Christmas now. And Christmas is intended to be a reminder. A reminder that nothing is too hard for him. That the power of our mighty God is real. Even if we may not see it. Even if we may not see it the way we want to see it. And so I just want to share with you here today just some ideas on what this power of God, the fact that Jesus came as our mighty God, what it means to us. And the first thing is this, that understand that Jesus' power is at work in you. Jesus' power is at work in you. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and, and 13, we read this, dear, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. He's at work in you. Now, we know, it's no secret, that we live in a culture that often communicates to us in a variety of different ways that life is all about us, that life is about me, that life is about what we want. And sometimes we can then begin to think that God's mighty power it's about me, about us getting what it is that we want. That's the reason why there are churches and pastors out there that teach the prosperity gospel. I don't know if you've heard about this. You probably have. It's just this idea that, that says that God wants all people, everyone, everywhere to always be happy, healthy, and wealthy. And that if bad things happen, it's just because you're not seeking him. <laughs> that you're doing something wrong. My friends, Christmas, it's about God's power working in you. Helping us to become what he wants us to be. Christmas is about God working in us, taking us from being selfish and self-centered to being more selfless. 
It's about God working in us, helping to develop in us the fruits of the Spirit. Fruits like love and compassion and peace and patience and gentleness and self-control. And so when we understand what Christmas really is about, Christmas, it really can be the most wonderful time of the year. If you allow it to be a reminder of the mighty God who came into the world simply because he loved us. If you allow Christmas to be a reminder that God has not forgotten you and he has not given up on you and that his mighty power, it really is working in you and all around you, even if you may not see it. Now, not only is God's power working in you, but Jesus' power is also working for you. Jesus' power is working for you. In Isaiah 40, verses 28 through 31, it says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. You know, the idea here in the original language is this idea of the best of the best when it comes to like athletic prowess. We're talking like an Olympic athlete, a professional athlete whose whose body is kind of like mine. No. Just making sure if you're still with me. (laughs) But the idea, it's the best of the best. And how even the best of the best sometimes get tired. And I think this is a strong reminder for us at Christmas that we don't have to pretend. We we don't have to just put on a face, a a mask, and, and say everything's okay, everything's good. And pretend that we have it all together. Because it's okay to say, I'm tired. It's okay to say, I'm weary. It's okay to say, I can't do it on my own. It's okay to do that because even the best of the best sometimes get tired. Let me ask you, friends. Where is your hope? Because the prophet makes it clear that those who hope in the Lord will find strength. In other words, if your hope is in what the world can offer, you're going to get tired, you're going to be weary, you're going to want to give up, you're going to be hopeless. If your hope is in the things that the world says Christmas is about, that's only going to carry you for so long. Where is your hope? Because Isaiah says, if your hope is in the Lord, if your hope is in the meaning of the Advent season, Christ coming into this world for you and I, people he loves, then you're going to be strengthened. Are things always going to be easy? No. But he's always going to be there to strengthen you, to lift you up, to hold you up to empower you. So where's your hope? I know some of you, you're tired right now, right? Some of you, you are worn out and weary from a year that has just been utterly exhausting. Some of you, that's where you're at. You're worn out and tired from a year in which you've dealt with some intense challenges Intense challenges that maybe you've never had to deal with before. 
Some intense challenges that you might have never thought you would ever have to deal with. And you're just tired and worn out and weary. And now Christmas comes, right? Christmas is here now. And, and, and you might be on one side of it, you know, excited that Christmas is here because in some ways it is the most wonderful time of the year. But in other ways, it just kind of amplifies what's already going on in your life. And, and so you're excited about Christmas, but you're looking at Christmas and you're sort of maybe just overwhelmed about all that there is to do and all that the world says Christmas is about. Friends, the good news of Christmas, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that there's power available. God's mighty power is available. God gives strength and he gives power to the weak. And to the weary. And so if that's where you are at right now, friends, you are right where God wants you to be. You're like, what? That doesn't make any sense. God wants me to weak, be weak and, and, and weary and, and powerless? No, he doesn't want you there. But, but when he has you there, he has you in a position to be able to turn to him. To be able to rely on him. To be able to say, God, I can't do it. But you can. With your mighty power. Working in me and working for me. I can do it. And so, if you're tired, if you're worn out, would you just turn to God? And we just, just admit to God that you are tired and weary and weak and let him strengthen you? Would you just choose to depend on the power of our mighty God that was born into our world to be our rescue? Because it's often when we are at our weakest and our lowest that Jesus' power works most powerfully for us As he carries us along. One of the greatest men in the New Testament is the Apostle Paul. My guess is you've probably heard something about him. He was this amazing servant of God. Arguably the best Christian missionary ever. Had this miraculous conversion experience on a, as he was traveling on a road. and He wrote a large portion of the New Testament... But he was a guy that was far from perfect. In fact, he was a guy who had a profound weakness. And we don't really know what that weakness was. A lot of scholars have speculated about what it was, but we don't really know. But what we do know is that on three different occasions, he asked our mighty God to take it away. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, God's power, it works best in weakness. Why is that? It's because of what Paul says, that God's grace is all sufficient. God's grace is all that we need. And so your weakness and your struggles and your limitations, the things that you might think of being as liabilities or disqualifiers, you know what they actually do? They actually are opportunities to draw closer to God. They're opportunities to allow the power of our mighty God, Jesus Christ, to become even more real to you. Because in the kingdom of God, weakness leads to strength. 
in the economy of God, weakness leads to strength. When we admit, I am weak, I am powerless, I can't do it on my own, God's strength and His amazing grace takes over and empowers us. There's an old story, sort of a, a fable, I guess, if you will. Maybe you've heard of it before, but it's a, about a little turtle one day that was climbing a tree very slowly. Slowly because, well, that's what turtles do, right? They move slowly. And after several hours, the turtle finally reaches the top. And then he jumps into the air, waving his front legs as hard as he can until he crashes to the ground. And so he gets up. He, he climbs that tree again. And he jumps again. And again, he crashes right into the ground. Well, the little turtle tries this again and again. And the whole time while he's trying to get up that tree and, and fly out of that tree, there are a couple of birds sitting on the edge of a branch that are watching with pain. And finally, the, the, the female bird turns to the male bird and says, Honey, don't you think that it's time that we tell our little turtle that he's not a bird? <laughs> think about that. Sometimes in life, we just think, if I can just try harder, no matter how much harder the turtle tried to fly, he wasn't going to be able to fly. He just wasn't. It didn't matter that the two little birds had adopted the little turtle. He wasn't meant to fly. He wasn't going to fly. Sometimes in life, I think it's like that. We just think, if I can try harder, if I can just push a little harder through this, that I can do it. But so often in life, it's not about trying harder. It's just not. Trying harder to, to do it on our own. Because we're never stronger than when we admit that we can't. We're never stronger than than when, when we admit our own weakness and we recognize that on our own we can't, but our mighty God can. And so we just have to surrender to Him and let Him empower us and strengthen us. So look, whatever it is, friends, that you're struggling with, whatever it is that you're trying harder to do on your own, you just need to know that the message of Christmas is that the mighty power of God is made available to us through the birth of Jesus Christ. And that it is His power that is working in you. And it's working for you. Not only that, but Jesus' power, lastly, is also at work through you. Jesus' powers at work through you, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The advent of Christmas, the advent of Christ, it gives you a purpose. And it gives you a ministry that is bigger than yourself. Because if you have surrendered to and submitted to him, then you have the mighty power of God in you. You see, that's what the Bible says. That when we give our lives to Jesus, when we confess our faith in him, that in the act of obedience known as baptism, we receive the Holy Spirit. The very Holy Spirit of God comes to live inside of us and takes up residence in us and empowers us and strengthens us and works in us and through us. We have the mighty power of God in us. What a Christmas gift that is, friends. Now, I just want to tell you a little bit here about what the mighty power of God can do. 
I just want us to understand that there is no limits on what the mighty power of God can do. And so I just want to tell you just a little bit about me, a little bit about my story, a little bit about what makes me, me. You see, what, what you don't know is that there is no human reason why I should be standing here before you today. None at all. And I'm not just talking about the fact that my family and I recently moved from Virginia to Kansas. To a state I'd never been to, a state we had never lived in, to a state that we knew no one. I am saying there is no human reason why I should be standing here before you. Because there is a reason much deeper than that. It goes so much further back than that decision. You see, when when I was young, I had such severe learning disabilities that doctors told my parents, and I, I am not making this up, I am not exaggerating this. I know sometimes preachers sometimes exaggerate their stories. I am not exaggerating this in any way. When I was just a little kid, Some doctors at a very well-respected children's hospital told my parents that I would never be able to speak properly. And now you can't shut me up. (laughs) Not only did did they tell tell my parents that I would never be able to speak properly, but they also said that I would never be able to do some very simple things that we sometimes take for granted, like ride a bike. I haven't done it in a while but I can ride a bike. And even when, by God's mighty power, I was able to overcome those weaknesses. In junior high school, I was so shy that there was, I would rather do anything, anything, like even take a zero on an assignment than get up in front of a group of people and talk. I hated it that much. I was so afraid of that. Friends, I stand before you today as evidence, as a testimony of the mighty power of Jesus Christ. And I know that some of us here today have similar stories. That you are here today. You are where you're at. You are doing what God has called you to do by the mighty power of of Jesus Christ, because that's the mighty God we worship. That's the mighty God that we celebrate His coming at Christmas time. And so at the very heart of the Christmas story, friends, is this mighty God, okay? I get excited about this. I don't know. Anybody anybody else excited? The heart of Christmas is this mighty God who works in mighty ways through ordinary people. And I, I think it's very interesting to find that the, the Greek word, the language of the, the New Testament for ordinary is the word idiotes. Sound familiar? It's from where we get our word idiots. And so biblically speaking, this isn't me saying it, okay? This is the Bible saying it. Biblically speaking, we are just a bunch of idiots. Sometimes we are. Let's be honest. That is, we're a bunch of ordinary people. Just a bunch of ordinary people. But friends, something extraordinary happens when ordinary people submit to the mighty power of a mighty God that is working in us to change us. Something extraordinary happens when ordinary people submit to the mighty God of the manger. And he begins working in us, working to change us so that by his power, we can change the world. And so that's the challenge for us right now. That's what we need to commit to do to change the world by his mighty power. Now, not only here at Christmas time, but we have a new year right around the corner. 
As we enter into a new year soon, we have possibilities. The possibility is there to do great things. Why? Because we have a mighty God that we worship and serve. A mighty God that can do more than we ever ask or imagine. And so the challenge for us is to commit to living our lives in a way that showcases the mighty power of our great Savior. So our worship team comes to lead us in a song of praise now to wrap up our service again. I want you to know that this is also a time of decision. If you have a decision to make, you're invited to come and to make that decision. And for most of us, the decision we need to make is to commit to living our lives in such a way that we are showcasing the mighty power of our God. But perhaps there's someone here today who has a different spiritual decision to make. And so if that might be you, if, if you're sort of wrestling with God now about what you need to do with your life or the decision that you need to make, I want to ask you, have you surrendered to and experienced the mighty power of the one who was born into this world so that you can be made strong. Have you? If you're thinking, I don't think I know him. If you're thinking, I've never really publicly confessed my faith in him or I've never been baptized into him. If you've never made that decision for yourself, I invite you to come. I'll be up front over here as we sing and as we worship God. You can let me know on the uh, tear-off card on your bulletin and just fill that out. Just put a note on there that you have a decision that you'd like to talk about. I'd love to follow up with you. If you have a prayer request, you can put that prayer request on that tear-off card as well and just drop it off in the offering box on your way out. You can talk to me out in the lobby. I'd love to talk with you. But whatever it is, whatever decision God is laying on your heart, don't put it off. Don't put it off. Would you pray with me? Mighty God and Heavenly Father, help us to see that Christmas is all about you. That this Advent season is all about you, a mighty God working in us and working through ordinary people. And so, God, right now, we just ask that you open our eyes and open our hearts to recognize that your power is real and that Jesus' power is available to us all who will call upon his name. And so it's in the name of the wonderful counselor and the mighty God, Jesus, that we pray.